Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to begin, and we're just so delighted to see you all here. And we're excited to welcome you to Spelman College and the Black American Portrait Symposium. My name is Cheryl Finley, and I'm the director of the Atlanta University Center Art History and Curatorial Studies Collective. And my name is Liz Andrews, and I'm the executive director of the Spelman College Museum of Fine Art. So we're, we're really, really happy that you've all come from near and far to join us this afternoon. Um, it's so great to see so many friends in the audience, um, colleagues as well, distinguished guests, artists, students, scholars uh, from here at Spelman College in the city of Atlanta, from around the country, and of course, across the Atlanta University Center from Clark Atlanta University and Morehouse College as well. So I just want you all to give a rousing applause to yourself for being here. So I wanna reiterate just a couple of things that are in our program for you today. And this is actually the very first time that the museum at Spelman and the, the program that I direct, the AUC Art Collective is having a joint symposium. And it's a really important, I think, milestone for us working collectively and collaboratively in a very synergistic way um, here. And we want you to really enjoy the two days of conversations that we have prepared for you. They're gonna be performances, presentations, and we're also gonna be asking a lot of questions of you around portraiture and around the themes of this exhibition. Um, there are students and faculty who are here that will be engaging with you as well. And some of the questions that we've been considering include what defines a portrait and what can we learn from the collecting practices and histories of studio art programs at historically black colleges and universities, such as the schools of the Atlanta University Center. We're also interested in what the implications are of the abundance and market for black figurative works, particularly in our current moment. We also want to ask questions about representations of the black body in painting and in performance, film, sculpture, photography, and spoken word and how these can define and reconfigure the medium of portraiture itself. So I'd like to share just a little bit um, with you, and some of this is in your program, some of it is not, um, about the Atlanta University Center Art, Histories and, Art History and Curatorial Studies Collective. It is a mouthful. Um, we are also known as the AUC Art Collective, and when we go for our rebrand, we'll become the collective, I think. <laughs> So the AUC Art Collective is at Spelman College, Morehouse College, and Clark Atlanta University. And we are here to train students from these institutions for careers in the visual arts. We're housed in the Department of Art and Visual Culture at Spelman College. And this is an innovative program that aims to shape the future of the art world and to position the Atlanta University Center as a leading incubator of African-American professionals in these fields. And the AUC Art Collective is made possible by generous support from the Alice L. Walton Foundation. And students in our program, as you've seen from the slides that have been passing by, students in our program are also eligible for scholarships, paid summer internships, and also a very robust field study program. Now, I also just wanted to give you a little bit of history of, of the symposium and how it fits sort of in the mission of the AUC Art Collective. That is, it's an academic symposium and we're really, really excited to be partnering with the museum because there's such an amazingly gorgeous exhibition that I think you've all had the chance to see, Black American Portraits. And to be able to engage with the exhibition on campus this semester, not only in our classes as faculty and students here at Spelman, Clark, and Morehouse, but also to be able to engage with all of you over these two days uh, of a symposium. Now, the first symposium that we had as a program took place just before the pandemic in January of 2020. And I'll say it was really a movable feast. It was a symposium that was called 
to preserve a legacy art conservation at the AUC. And that was kind of riffing off of Rick Powell, who is a, an alumnus of Morehouse College, his own uh, exhibition and conservation program uh, that looked at um, how to preserve and conserve through art conservation uh, the works of artists who were in the collections of historically black colleges and universities. And that, that was a show and a program that he put together almost well, a little bit more than 20 years ago. And so in that first symposium, we'd like to think of it as that time as a movable feast. We began at Spelman College. We went through Morehouse. We were at Clark Atlanta. Uh, University Art Museum. We looked at some of the works in the museum, and then we moved on to the AUC Woodruff Library. We're going to do something similar today um, and tomorrow. It's going to be also a movable feast. We have an amazing lineup for you in just a few moments. Um, but in terms of what we're thinking about for the symposium, over the next couple of days, we'll have conversations, panels, performances, and ongoing events as well. Um, tomorrow, we're going to be at the AUC Woodruff Library. So just to make a note of that, that's where we're going to be located for the symposium. But in addition, here at Spelman College, we have amazing photographers who can take your portrait. You can have your own Black American portrait made um, by E. Spencer, who's a graduating senior, and Denise Hewitt, who is a transfer, uh, a, a domestic exchange student from NYU. Um, in addition to that, in the afternoon, during the lunch hour, we really encourage you to come back to please um, take advantage of the studio visits that you can have with graduating seniors here in the art program. So there's a lot going on and we really want you to be able to take advantage of that as well. And the last thing that I wanted to do, you want to do now? Go for it. Okay. The last thing that I wanted to do is just um, acknowledge um, many people who were are responsible for this event um, over the next two days. And uh, these include, uh, of course, our own uh, president, Dr. Helene Gale, the 11th president of Spelman College, Dolores Bradley Brennan, provost Spelman College, the Department of Art and Visual Culture, Spelman College, the Robert W. Woodruff Library and Archives staff, the Spelman College Museum of Fine Art staff, the Atlanta University Center Art History and Curatorial Studies Collective staff, Spelman College Technology Services, Spelman College Event Operations, Spelman College Facilities and Security, the Clark Atlanta University Art Museum staff, E. Spencer, Denise Hewitt, Kelly Mitchell, and the students of the Studio Art Program, Spelman College, the AUC Art Collective Student Volunteers, Spelman Museum of Fine Art Ambassadors, Warren Huntley Presents Incorporated, Kent and Tamara Kelly, the Alice L. Walton Foundation, and the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. Thank you. And there are many others who need to be thanked, especially for this exhibition. I want to give a huge shout out to the Wish Foundation, which made this exhibition possible. It is a very ambitious show for a museum of our size, and without that support, it would not have been possible. The Mellon Foundation was also hugely supportive of this exhibition, and then Arthur Lewis and Hao Nguyen were major supporters. And of course, for every exhibition at the Spelman College Museum of Fine Art, we depend on the friends of the museum. So thank you all for being here and for supporting us. I also want to say thank you to Rachel and Amalade. I wanna say thank you to my wonderful co-curator here at the Spellman version of Black American Portraits, Karen Comer Lowe. I don't know if you can tell, but we had a ball putting this show together in the galleries here. And I hope that comes through because every alcove, every wall, every placement is done out of um, genuine reverence to the artists and the legacies. And of course, thank you, Shannon Kimbrough, our collections manager for making the seemingly impossible possible here. Thank you also, Christine Perry Espinoza and Brandy Pettijohn for your work. So, this exhibition, Black American Portraits, came out of the moment of 2020. 
So in the summer of that year, of course, we were in the middle of the pandemic. And we were also seeing images of George Floyd and other Black people brutalized and murdered. Those were the images that were going across our screens. And so my co-curator, Christine Wykim and I were putting together the Obama portraits tour. We knew people were gonna come out in droves to see Amy Sherald's rendition of Michelle LeVon Robinson Obama and Kehinde Wiley's President Barack Obama. They're some of the most iconic images we have today, even as recognizable as the Mona Lisa at this point. But we wanted people to walk away with a history. And so thinking back to David Driscoll's foundational 1976 show at LACMA, Two Centuries of Black American Art. It was curated exactly 45 years before Black American portraits. And of course, David Driscoll, very early on in the pandemic, passed tragically, tragically from COVID. So we wanted to honor that foundational exhibition, which was the first comprehensive survey of Black American art. But we also wanted people to know that these portraits did not come from nowhere. Portraiture is a tool of power that has been used for generations by monarchs in Europe and Black Americans from the advent of photography, which we'll hear about from our keynote, Deborah Willis, tomorrow morning. So the show is rooted in joy and abundance and beauty and also complexity. And it spans over 200 years and includes work across mediums. So you'll see painting, photography, sculpture, collage, and even an augmented reality monument, which you can experience right outside of this building. So the thing that makes this show special here at Spelman, of course, is that we are the only museum in the nation dedicated to art by and about women of the African diaspora, Black women. Yes, that deserves a round of applause. And so this is an exhibition that includes male artists, women artists, trans artists even, but we wanted to center Black women. And so part of the effort of putting this show together here at Spelman was to bring in new works into the collection. So Karen brought in a photograph by the Atlanta-based photographer, Sheila Prebright, of Spelman alumna, Stacey Abrams during her 2018 run for governor. That will stay in Spelman's permanent collection forever. And we also brought in three major acquisitions with the partnership of the Terra Foundation for American Art based out of Chicago. There are two sculptures by the incredible Harlem Renaissance sculptor, Augusta Savage, without whose studio and generosity, so many of the artists we know would not be in existence. And then we commissioned a painting by Spelman alumna, Kalita Rawls. The title is Thy Name We Praise. Those of you who went to Spelman know that that is the first line of the Spelman hymn. She made the piece specifically for Spelman College and it will stay in our permanent collection along with the Terra Foundation's collection forever. And it is the last work that she is doing in this series that she has become so famous for, of Black women in white dresses underwater. The white dress ceremony, the Spelman blue, it's very fitting for this school. And those three acquisitions, the two Augusta Savage sculptures and the painting by Kalita Rawls were brought in honor of Dr. Mary Schmidt Campbell, the 10th president of Spelman College, who just stepped down at the end of last year, last school year, and is so foundational to art history and to museums. Speaking of presidents of Spelman College, I think I have said enough, and I would love to welcome the 11th president of Spelman College, Helene Gale.
Thank you so much. Um, it is just wonderful to be able to be here today and um, to welcome everybody to Spelman for this incredible panel. Um, you've heard a lot about the genesis of this, and um, you know most of you have had a chance to see the exhibit. If I say that this is game changing for Spelman and, and our museum, it is a real understatement. I mean, this has been huge. Um, at the opening itself, I think there were 500 people, 600 people who came out, um, and there have been throngs of people coming to see this exhibit. So this is really something we are so, so proud of, and we are so pleased to have you here in the audience for what I know will be an incredible panel. Um, now, I don't have the art background that my predecessor, Mary Schmidt Campbell, had, and uh, Liz has already talked about how she did so much to build the art program here, but art has a place in my life just like it does in all of our lives. Uh, it enriches us, it tells our story, it speaks to our culture, it contributes to social change, it nourishes our souls, and so, so much more. That's why I am so proud to be able to introduce this panel of artists who have all contributed to this incredible exhibit. We are so, so fortunate to be the second uh, museum that has had this exhibit coming straight from LA County Museum or LACMA where it debuted. And it also speaks to, I think, the spirit of sisterhood that is so much a part of Spelman. I think Liz coming from LACMA, um, you know, really was such an impetus to getting this exhibit here. And, you know, I think, again, speaks to the power of our sisterhood. We have two of our artists who claim Spelman as, as part of their artistic beginnings, and I know they will talk more about it. Uh, but speaking of LACMA, it is my honor and special, <laughs> special pleasure to introduce your moderator, Naima Keith, who will moderate and introduce the rest of the panel. It's my honor to introduce her because she is a star in the museum <laughs> and the curatorial world. Naima is currently the Vice President of Education and Public Programs at LACMA, overseeing all aspects of the museum's educational program that serves more than 650,000 community members. In 2021, she was also the co-curator for Prospect 5 in New Orleans. Prior to LACMA, she was the Deputy Director and Chief Curator at CAM, the California African American Museum. During her time there, besides curating several major exhibits, she was the 2017 recipient of the David Driscoll Prize given every year at the High Museum of Atlanta for an individual that has made outstanding contribution to um, uh, African American art. Prior to camp, um, uh, Naima was an associate curator at Studio Museum in Harlem and held a curatorial position at the Hammond Museum in LA. It is also my special pleasure to introduce Naima because she is a Spelman graduate, class of 2003, who then went on to get her master's degree from UCLA. But closer to my heart, she's my stepdaughter, my husband's firstborn, and the mother of our two grandchildren. <laughs> so, before I start telling grandchildren's stories, I am going to bring to the podium Naima J. Keith. I was, I was going to give you a hug. <laughs> Actually, I was thinking that we could all come up now because I know we're a little bit behind time. So if it's okay with you, I would love to, I know people are eagerly waiting to hear from the three artists, so if you don't mind. I want to just obviously want to say hi and thank you for joining me uh, this evening for what I know will be okay. Oh, I know. Huh. Surround sound. Um, 
I know it's going to be an amazing conversation, but before we get started, first, I just want to say hi to my Spelman sisters. It feels good to be home. Hi, ladies. <laughs> it's almost a little surreal to be uh, to be back on campus. I've come back for, you know, previous, um, you know, reunions, but just there's something about just like seeing the campus like every day and, you know, um, went to the bookstore, probably bought every t-shirt in the bookstore. So anyway, it just it feels good to be home. So I just wanted to give first a shout out to my Spelman sisters. Um, I also want to thank um, Liz Andrews. Um, thank you so much for inviting us, as well as Cheryl Finley, and of course, my stepmom, Dr. Helene Gale. Um, and uh, I think we're just going to jump right in. Would you like me to read your? I think we're, I think everyone pretty much knows exactly who you guys are. So I don't okay. think I really need to. <laughs> I think we can just jump right into the conversation. Yeah. Yeah. So I wanted to kind of start with the conversation or a, a question for all three of you, um, just to kind of like loosen us up a bit and kind of start the conversation. I think what, um, people notice about your work, or at least I notice about you, is the fact that, you know, a lot, uh, many of your works kind of render people, Black people, um, in kind of quintessential American moments, right? Swimming, at the beach, dancing, jumping the broom. I mean, there's so many moments that are just every day. Can you talk about um, the importance of depicting, especially Black people, in everyday moments, in, in moments of leisure, or moments of Black joy? Why did you make the decision to black people in that way. Well, hello. Hi. <laughs> Pleasure to be here. Um, I think that um, when I was in my 30s and I was trying to figure out, you know, the kind of work that I wanted to make, when I when I looked at out into the world, you know, I would go to an art fair and like see what kind of work was being made, I didn't see certain stories. And there, these were the stories that were really important to me and helped me form who I was, right? So um, I think where I used to say like, you know, black is more than just a verb. There's, there's an interior life that I think needs to be represented that for me was represented through photography, um, which influences my work. And so I think that's what brought me to that point was like not, not seeing um, a fulsome conversation about, um, my blackness in museum institutions or, you know, even on television outside of like a few shows, mm -hmm. you know, and I think that that all of these stories need to be told all different kinds of ways of of how we live and exist need to be shared. Um, and I chose to do that through, you know, the paintings that I make. Um, for me, um, water became a part of my visual language. I loved it for multiple reasons. One, because it was look, it was like a form of realism and abstraction that happens to the form in water. But the more history I thought of, of black people's uh, one, um, the stereotype that black people can't swim, thinking of that and actually the access to water, the usage of water against our bodies and as in hosing or or exclusion in pools, all of that became such a conversation that's always behind the work by putting us in water with um, not control, but with agency. Like I really try to, no one looks like they're afraid. They look powerful. This is our element. And I feel like the stereotype of black people with water is almost like it's not ours. We do not claim it as a space for us. And I wanted that to be underneath the work, no matter what I'm talking about. Really, this element, like air, is ours too. Right. And for me, I, I echo both of you that we need to see representations of ourselves. And, and for me personally, uh, my work started just recreating the family photographs. So my grandmother's photo album. Those were my first subjects. So always it started with us first, who's closest to you, who's at home, and me thinking about who were the people that I miss, the people who were long gone before I was born. And so I guess it, it always started at home and the work that you see of mine now, it's still always, I feel like that's my strength is, is looking back or looking forward and recording who we are. I love this crowd, by the way. I can hear like the free <laughs> answer. It's like a, a nice little uh -huh. So I'm like, feels good to be 
But um, Amy, I think, you know, seeing your most recent show in London, um, it was striking to me just how uh, taking it kind of a step further, not just seeing us at, a, at such a large scale, but also how you really kind of reimagined and kind of pushed the boundaries of or kind of taking on some of the more iconic photographs, things that we've seen so many times, but never really saw ourselves. And I'm simply thinking about the uh, embrace or the kiss um, that was the sailor and the, the, the Caucasian sailor and the woman, um, you know, after World War II ended, they kind of iconic photograph of them kissing. And I remember kind of walking into the gallery and, and seeing that photograph and knowing exactly what you were referencing, but not, it just, it took me, it took my breath away because I think I, um, I honestly just didn't see myself ever in that moment. And so can you talk about kind of taking on such an iconic photograph? Um, not only do you reinsert, if you insert us as, as African-Americans, but you've also made it a same-sex couple. So you talk about even pushing things a little bit further um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and to kind of, like I said, taking on these kind of yeah. more iconic images of us. It was a, it was, um, at first it was like a really scary decision. Like I sat with that photograph for about six months and I knew I wanted to use it. I wasn't sure how. Um, for me, it's such a, you know, when I look back, at, when I look back at photography, I'm like really focusing on these, you know, iconic American moments. And um, I guess it's a recreation or a reimagination, but for me, it's just more like a, a taking an ownership of it in a way, um, because I feel like people have taken ownership of our stories. So I'm kind of like flipping, flipping the table. Um, and then also just wanting to see people that I care about represented um, and understanding the, um, you know, what's conversations uh, that are happening now, rights that are being revoked um, for people that are within the LGBTQI um, community. Um, and it just felt like the right thing to do. But I literally thought about it for two months. I was like, I don't know, it's, you know, like, what are people going to think? Like, what yeah. is this going to, you know, but I'm like, this is, this is what I want to do. Like I make work for me. I don't make work for, for anybody else. Um, and you know, the complexity, the complicatedness, I guess, um, that the, the unfairness that we had to, um, experience upon returning from that war and not being treated as citizens. Mm -hmm. So um, just really focusing on that, including us within that American narrative as I just, I'm, I'm really like trying to embrace my Americanness and like bring the word closer to home because it never quite meant anything to me until I was, you know, I tell the story all the time about being in Norway and like George Bush being president and, um, I was studying with a painter over there and there was a Norwegian that came up and we were like playing baseball and he's like, oh, you Americans, you know? And I was like, oh, I like, like I'm an American. You know, he didn't see my gender, my race. He just saw yeah. an American. And that really flipped something in my head in that moment that I've been trying to work out on canvas ever since and like really embrace the flag and flip the meaning. Cause I, you know, I grew up in Columbus, Georgia. When I saw an American flag, I felt unsafe. Right. I didn't think like um, patriotism, but when I thought patriotism, if I did, it wasn't the kind that included me, you know? So finding myself inside of, inside of these images that, um, that don't include me or my story, even though, you know, the four, when I think of forefathers, I think of a completely different, I think of yeah. our people and not George Washington. You know what I mean? So right. it's just really embracing that narrative. You said something um, earlier, Kalita, about uh, water and just like the association with water and, you know, this idea that uh, water, when you think of Black people in water, it's like you said, either the stereotypes around swimming or around like history and trauma and those kind of things. Unfortunately, I automatically kind of think of trauma, I mean, thinking about like the ocean and that kind of thing, I automatically kind of think about trauma. And so what kind of first attracted you to wanting to prepare? Black bodies of water, because I will full disclosure. Khalid and I have known each other for a long time. Our kids are friends, and all that kind of stuff. So I've seen, I've seen quite a few bodies of work, and so I'm just kind of curious on like what first attracted you 
was it like a flip of the switch? Like it was something that someone said, like, you know, Amy kind of referenced, or was there something? It started uh, with me seeing a friend at school. It looked like they were working out. And I went up and said, what is, what are you doing? Because you look great. She said she was in a swim class. So I said, I want to join. Um, and when I went to this swim, I, I went to a, uh, this class that was at a master swim club. And I, you know, I was a person that went to public pools and I really thought I could swim until I got there. <laughs> yes, it was ridiculous and arrogant of me. I was like, I can swim. I went to, you know. So I show up to this master swim class and um, I couldn't even get all the way across. So she gave me a flipboard and I started a kickboard and I started swimming with them, start learning really how to swim. Oh. You know, I learned, you know, everything from the stroke to everything. And then when I was in there looking at the bodies underwater and just being there at high noon, which is the worst light, but it was just so beautiful, the shimmers that were happening. I was like, I want to bring this in to my practice. And I think I'm always centered of when I'm thinking of, you know, just if I did first word associations, if I think of a man, my brain thinks of a black man because I think of my dad, mm -hmm. you know? So I didn't think of black bodies in water. I thought of a body in water and they were going to be black. That's just, and then it started to connect more. Mm -hmm. Then I started doing more research. Then I started thinking about it at another level, but that's how it really began. It was just being there and just seeing how beautiful the light looked in water. And I yeah. wanted to capture that because it feels very spiritual. You know, when I think of water and light, it's just, and that's what I really want to capture in most of the work. Yeah. Are you healing? Still, yeah. Healing. Yeah, healing. Yeah. Are you still swimming every day? I no, I am not. <laughs> <laughs> I am not going to lie. No, I want to say, yeah, I still swim. I no. was like, then no. I was like, she kicked you out I of the class. Should, Gosh, no, I did. You know, when COVID hit, the pools, you know, shut. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And then I, I have swam since, but I'm not a regular, like I need to be, I need to go back because it was, it was healing for me. It was my meditation, that breathing, you know, that breath stroke. And, and it, I need to go back. <laughs> I need to go back. We all need to get back we, to the gym. After we need to get back, <laughs> but I will get back, but I love the water. Yeah. But speaking of that, that shimmer and that color and, and kind of really noticing how, you know, bodies look in water mm -hmm. um, and particularly, you know, uh, brown bodies and color. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Bisa, the way you use color, I think we can all agree is unmatched. I mean, it is just, mm -hmm. oh, okay, yes. <laughs> 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 I, um, my dad and I were at the museum earlier and these, uh, f three or four women were like in awe. They were like, oh, and this, and you notice this, but I mean, they were like going on and on and they were like, is that Chadwick Boseman? I mean, it was like a whole <laughs> moment, um, they were having in, in front of the work, but just the, the way in which you use color and the relationship between color. Um, can you talk about how you're thinking, how you think about color, mm -hmm. how you think about, um, the images that you start with or the mm -hmm. images that you're thinking about and how mm -hmm. that kind of gets translated into a quilt. Mm -hmm. um, and really just, are you thinking about the emotions that you know what's going to evoke for the viewer? I mean, how are you thinking about color and its relationship to the viewer? Well, first I want to say along with Amy, like I'm very dependent on photographs. And when I spoke about my grandmother's photographs, they're all black and white or sepia tone. So now I'm still drawing the black and white photographs but I'm also a child of the 70s and I grew up on black and white TV. I remember when it switched over to color. I feel like it was like 1980. Suddenly it was like everybody had a color TV. Right. It was a big deal and then it was nothing. It was like everybody had it. But that transition didn't, because I was a child in it, you accept it as normal. And so now when I'm working, it feels perfectly fine take a black and white photo and make it into color because you all of us in this room who were born before 1980 right you did the same thing or if if you're younger young people too if you like <laughs> looking at old, older movies black and white movies you're doing the same thing when you look at a photograph at Gordon Parks you're also you know that person's not gray right so the, I guess the difference is I'm just illustrating it um, for everyone else to see. And the colors that I'm using 
are colors from the 70s and the 80s. Like when you think about, I when, when Kalita, when you talked about the blue and how the color, that shimmer, mm -hmm. that light coming through, mm -hmm. when I did the portrait of Chadwick Boseman, I think about things like that. Like mm -hmm. what is the blue in my mind that reminds me of, of let's say more somber or calm? but we all have our own interpretation of that. Um, I use color to express emotion. So I like showing the duality of all of it. We all have two parts. Mm -hmm. You have your inner person and your outer person. You know, your happy, excited self and yourself when you don't wanna be bothered. And we are different in different situations. And I don't, I'm, it's not that I'm trying to defeat a narrative that Black people are one way, because I'm really mainly speaking to us and that we know that we're different ways. So when I did the portrait of Chadwick Boseman, I'm thinking about he's the Black Panther. Since he passed, he'll always be young. He'll always be handsome. He'll always be strong. He'll always be T'Challa. If you ask like any child under the age of five, my friend's son, when she showed him the photo, she said, who's this? He said, it, she said, it's T'Challa. Mm -hmm. So he will always be these things. So I wanted to show the red as the color of power, and passion, and love, and intention. And then on the other side of him, there's, there's his more serious side, obviously as an actor, but it's also like the way I felt that this is a moment of somber, this, this is a moment of reflection. And then in one note, the outfit that the photograph, Chadwick Boseman, that the photo that I took it from, he was at the Met Gala and he was wearing all white. A beautiful Versace suit. Shout out to Versace. <laughs> but, <laughs> yes, shout out. But I'm, um, my father's from Ghana, so I'm half Ghanaian. I mean, genetically, I'm way more than half Ghanaian, but Culturally, right. I'm half the name. And in Ghana, amongst his people, when a person passes away, an older person, you, the, the mourners come in white because it's a celebration. And it's also the way you feel. They lived a long life. So you're not missing them or you know, you're missing them, but you are not necessarily in anguish. Mm -hmm. But when a younger person dies, the mourners come in red and black. Um, black would be like your neighbors and your friends, um, acquaintance type friends who know you. And then your family will come in mostly red because they're the ones who are really suffering right. and they're in pain. So I like to use color to define what it is that I'm trying to say about the person. And I think that we all seem to respond to it. I'm glad people do. I didn't know they were going to, but I'm glad that when you look at the work that you kind of understand. Yeah. You're, you're talking about photography um, makes me think of, of Amy, your process. Mm -hmm. From my understanding, you also start from photographs. Yeah. Can you talk about, can you talk about your process? Um, but can you also talk about how you see the relationship between your, the photographs um, and then using those that inform the painting, using those photographs to inform the painting? Yeah. It's funny because I, I don't, I take color photographs and I leave them in color while I'm painting. And I, so I paint them gray from color to gray, even though I know I could print it out in gray, I still would rather for some reason paint from color. Yeah. I don't know why, yeah. Yeah. I don't know why, but um, okay, tell me the question one more time. No, just, it, it's just about your process. Like I know yeah. that you also, you take yeah. photographs of people that you see on the street and you, right. you know, you invite them to your studio and you. I you... find, I find people, um, it's like an instant thing. I fall in love with them and then awkwardly ask them if they'll come and let me, you know, photograph them. Um, for me, the photograph is the sketch. And so I, I don't have a sketchbook who Arturo Lindsay right there is like always trying to get us to like have a sketchbook. <laughs> Me and I used to hate it. I'm like, I don't want to get to pointless. But I mean, I um, I don't know what that makes me, but I don't have one. But I I take over 150 images per per work, and I comb through each one. And even for the the sailors, for example, like the positioning happens during the making of the picture. So 
I was, you know, moving hands up, like spreading fingers. Like there's a lot of curating that happened so that I can get the, the picture, the image that I want. And then I take that image, um, decide on a background color. And that's the first thing that I do based on what the model is wearing. And then I start the process. But I think, you know, I fell in love with photography because those were the things that I had growing up. Mm -hmm. And then as an adult, um, Dr. Leslie King Hammond gave me Dr. Willis's book, History of the Black Female Body. I was in grad school and I was like, that blew my mind. Like there's an image of a woman named Delia in the book. And it's a, it's a profile, a photograph of her. But I just remember thinking like our jaw lines are similar, like our profiles were similar. And there's something just, that's just so deep about photography. There's something that, um, you know, it's not, I, I'll, I mean, I say I sound crazy when I talk like this, but it's like, I think there's an energy exchange that happens between the model, the, the painter and the canvas. There's like a cyclical thing that happens. And I think when I look at black and white photography, I see the stillness of the moment and the, the, the spirit of the person really comes forth, mm -hmm. you know, for us to read. Um, and so when you're looking back at images of your family, it's like the only, you know, my, for my grandmother, Jewel, I only had one picture of her and that was the way that I had to get to know her. Mm -hmm. And even though I couldn't see how brown she was or wasn't, you know, something about her image being captiv capt captivated in a sepia toned, you know, picture, um, it just feels like I know her so deeply because of that. And, yeah. and I don't want to disregard color. I just don't know how to speak about it in the same way as yeah. I do with the feelings that I, I, um, that I feel when I'm looking at photography, you know, daguerreotypes and images like that yeah. and like how it connects and how my work has become a meditation on, on those kinds of images. Cause it was the first, it, I, I didn't see myself in our history. Like I saw myself in photography. So it was like, you know, those kind of books and, you know, um, documentaries. I'm drawing a blank on the documentary you made, Dr. Willis, but that that documentary on the history of photography really brought things home for me and like, you know, and uh, solidifying photography as like the starting point for the work. But I, I do want to say this idea of color for a little bit, because I think, um, apologies, I was just getting the time, but um, this idea of blue, I think, in particular, is such a prominent feature, in, especially in, in Amy and Kalita's work, I think, um, especially for this latest you know, exhibition, where blue is the background color is so, I mean, it is like, the energy level. I mean, it just gives you like this vibrancy. And of course, uh, the blue and the white, you're very specific about your choices mm -hmm. um, with the color blue. Um, how do you think about color choices? Because I know you talked about like this idea of seeing black and white photography, this energy that's the circular energy. But how do you think about color choices in terms of what they're wearing or what your subjects are wearing? How do you think about color choices in terms of, you know, skin color, uh, Khalid and your work? Can you talk about how you're thinking about color? Well, in skin color, when I did this last piece that's um, here at Spelman, I um, purposely thought about the stereotype of the Spelman woman. It looks like my look, like light skin, she got, you know, and I would purposely want to kind of dispel that, that when I was here at Spelman, women had all different complexions. So it was purposely wanted to give um, this beautiful, darker skinned woman this shine and this light in this white dress with the blue. I thought it was just um, important to me to expand that idea. Um, um, but color itself, in a lot of my work, uh, until you see it in person. Sometimes it does look kind of bl just blue and white, but I put a lot of colors in and mix it in the water or mix it in the form and the, in the skin or even in the clothing, um, even if it's subtle. I think that's very important or even making it like shine or shimmer mm -hmm. is, is very important to get um, a certain energy. And I think that happens through color. Mm -hmm. But I use photography too. I feel like I didn't say that. <laughs> Everyone, I do <laughs> photography face too. <laughs> me too. Me too. <laughs> we got you, girl. Me got too. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
it's intuitive for me. Like I like to have a lot of fun with it. Um, and I don't, I can't, you know, I get asked this question and, and I'm not really sure. Like I always say it was just from like spending my summers in Panama and like, mm -hmm. you know, if you go over uh, Arturo's house, it's like a wall, every wall is a different color. And he also painted with a lot of colors. So when I asked him to work for him, when I was, um, when I was, you know, taking classes with him at Spelman, um, you know, the reds, the blues, like all that, you know, I think I was just like subconsciously like taking it all in. But um, I archive all the colors that I use and I really try to make new colors. I mean, mm -hmm. like challenge myself in that way where, you know, there's like the tubed pinks between mm -hmm. like Gamblin, Old Holland and uh, Williamsburg, whatever. And I try to make my own pink yeah. that that's, you know, that, that I can use. Um, but I mean, it's, and I, and I also think like when I was in Europe this summer, I went to, um, I went to Madrid and I saw my first Velasquez in person. And I realized, oh. <laughs> yes. Yes, I realized that what I do, it's almost in reverse of what the masters did where, you know, they're painting like the pale skin and the backgrounds are really dark. Mm -hmm. And I have like the bright brightness surrounding the gray. So it's like I almost do it in reverse. So it sits off of the canvas in the same way, but it's in reverse. Yeah. Um, and it just makes sense. I mean, I think your DNA instructs you on like who you are, what you do. And it's just in my DNA. Like it's just what made, yeah. what clicked, you know, as like what was beautiful to me. So how do you think about scale in the relationship between portraiture? Um, I think what's, what's so great about Black American portraits is that you see just a range of portraits mm -hmm. um, in, a, in a range of different scales. But how do you three think about, like Visa, for example, like how did you not just, just to pick on Jack, you know, that particular work, but mm -hmm. how do you think about scale? I think. And the, the number of subjects in your work, like all of those mm -hmm. conversations. For me, it's uh, what's easy for me to work with, what's manageable. When I first started quilting, I was, I had turned away from painting because I was pregnant and the smell of the paint, you know, like phthalo blue, like as soon as you open the cap, oil paint, the smell would just send me out the room. I couldn't, I couldn't clean my brushes, the turpentine, I just couldn't manage it. Yeah. So one of my professors at Howard said, um, sorry, Spellman, it was Howard. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, I mean, I was going to say, sorry. No, I know you're, you're, you're surrounded. <laughs> you, you know, you know, each second is, is I, I come in peace. <laughs> that is, that was me. No, no, no. <laughs> but it's a but, scale. Yeah, but it it came, scale. I was born out of necessity in some way. Out of because, necessity. Yeah. Because, because you were pregnant. I was pregnant. I couldn't paint, but me working, um, when I work very big, I just can't manage it. It's like the, the Figures don't look the way I want them. They look they're too big. I can't control it. If it's really small, some pieces that I cut might be like the size of your earring or half of your earring. So if if it's a small figure this big, then I don't know what kind of micro instruments I'm using. So I found that life size or a little bit larger than I what I can manage. But I see beautiful works that are gigantic and. I feel like one day I'm gonna try it again. I have a wall for you. <laughs> <laughs> I got you. Hey, Lisa. <laughs> I like uh, I like to play with scale. I like doing smaller work sometimes because I want the viewer thinking of the viewer going in close. I enjoy the idea of moving back and forth, and I hope I like to play with a range of scales. And sometimes, like I was about to start this piece um recently and I had it all gessoed and ready and I was looking at it and then I was like no nah, they need to be larger than life I got it I'm not going to use it I'm going to order another canvas to to start yeah again because I knew for this moment how I want people to um interact with it I think of that like how the viewer will depending on what I'm going to paint sometimes I want them larger than life so they have to step back yeah so it was necessity for me too. I um two reasons. One was that I really wanted I wanted to make a life-size portrait 
but I felt like from here down was just kind of like a distraction. And I, you know, from the beginning, I wanted the viewer to, to be at eye level with the model. And then the second thing was like, if I made it too big, it became a storage problem. And then I would have to give her a U-Haul if I needed to move it. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I literally measured the back of my friend's SUV and like, that's how I came up with the size of like 54 by I love 43. It. <laughs> hey, because I could slide it in sideways. And if I had a little show here or there, I could be like, can I borrow your car? Right. Um, you know. But I love that like real life advice because that's that's real life yeah. like, in terms of considerations, right? Whether it's pregnancy or like- Yeah, you know, all those friends. things come into play oh, when it yeah. comes to art making. I mean, and I never made anything larger before I moved up to the New York area because I didn't have a freight elevator and everything that went through the door had to be seven feet one way or the other. So there, I had ideas that I couldn't manifest because they wouldn't fit out of the door. So, you know, moving helped me, you know, gave, gave me the opportunity to expand what I do. But then I've also made images, like there was a painting that I cut from the show in London because it was too big. You know what I mean? Like I got yeah. the figures on the canvas and I started working it. I'm like, these actually need to be like, like small portraits and not like this big size. So I, I, I get, I get ahead of myself sometimes and I have to like pull myself back in. <laughs> yeah. 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 But working at such a scale or in such a way does require a level of discipline, right? Like I know Kalita for you, for example, that you use very tiny brushes. I'm always amazed <laughs> at the size of your brushes. Oftentimes, can you talk about that, that discipline. How do you go into the studio every day? Do you like how do you um, find the kind of patience and discipline to work in the ways that you do? Um, my husband and my daughter, you know, I think all of us are probably we're workaholic beasts, right? You know, <laughs> because you you are so into you, you know you're in that mm -hmm. conversation with the piece and and it needs to be done. It's like it's it's almost it becomes like you're creating this living thing mm -hmm. and so it just takes over mm -hmm. i'm like i don't really need to eat like that's fine yeah, yeah. just have a bite right um, not that we're recommending that eat, no but, it's, it's, it just happens. Uh, yeah it does happen yeah, i think yeah. discipline might be remembering to take time off and relax yeah, yeah. breathe swim i got inspired when you said that also you about to go. You about to go. <laughs> we have to get together. Not this little. <laughs> Lisa was like, I don't know. What I don't know. Yeah. We'll get you do. <laughs> we'll swim. No, we'll get you. Yeah. We'll get you out in the water. Yeah. But no, I, I'm just the same, the same way. I got to remember. I get caught up in the hours while I'm painting. And then, yeah. Like, oh, yeah, I got to eat. Uh, sometimes I have to put a timer or people tell me to take a break and stretch or something. Right. I'll get so caught and then my back hurts. Yeah. I lose so much time that I physically can yeah. hurt myself. You have to yeah. discipline yourself to stay healthy, drink water. I even had Jordan Castile. Um, she gave, she, I, she's like sent me this Amazon package, open it up and she had bought me like a water pack to wear as a backpack <laughs> while I'm painting. <laughs> wow. I was like, I'm so dehydrated all the time. And like, I can't remember to drink water. But like, once you're in it, you're in it, you know? And um, you don't need discipline. You just go, yeah. wake up and work. Yeah. Yeah. I hear about the, the passion, the, 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 that you're so yeah. into it. I yeah. mean, deadlines yeah. don't help unless, like, we pay our bills with this. So yeah. it's like, if we don't paint, we don't eat. Yeah. You know? Right. There's so that. We, yeah. That helps. <laughs> that helps. <laughs> So I literally have probably 25 questions. Um, we haven't even talked about, you know, the Michelle Obama painting. We, there's so many things we have not talked about. I want to about self-care and love and all these things. But I also want to open it up um, to questions from the audience. Maybe we can kind of make this, uh, you know, kind of an exercise where we're hearing from the audience. And um, I'm kind of asking questions as well. So is there any? Oh, okay. Uh, there's a microphone. Um, I know they're asking. They're, they wanted me to ask people to, um, so that everyone can hear your question. To stand up and and to i do ask that people keep keep your questions short and sweet so we can make sure that we get through as many questions as there uh, during the time of black portraiture which is now um we are often talking about the way that we look at our bodies right and the way we look at ourselves um and looking at all your paintings the way you depict uh people of african-american descent within the african diaspora um, all of you have a different take on the way you use color can you talk about that? Because oftentimes 
like when we see black people, we use three different shades, right? It's brown, dark brown, light brown. Mm -hmm. But I've noticed in all of your paintings that sometimes they're purple, they're yellow, they're green. Sometimes they're gray. Sometimes they're dark black, not as much as Carrie James Marshall. And then um, Khalidia, uh, okay. ma'am. <laughs> okay, uh, clear. Um, that um, you use a very rich, even sometimes uh, reds and pinks in your browns. Can you talk about that, please? Um, I don't want to mix in my paint. I probably don't use much brown at all. You know, it starts with like blue, red, yellow, just to, and then keep playing with it um, until I get the color that I want to mixed with a complexion. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, there's such a range, there's such a beauty in our colors. There's so many undercolors, there's so many, you know, so I, I, I enjoy trying to um, have the skin tones in my pieces radiate, you know, mm -hmm. shimmer. I want to give off an element of, uh, yeah, just like just feel something more, mm -hmm. you know, and you look at it as everyone, mm -hmm. as we all do. Um, well, I, um, I used to paint brown people, black people, <laughs> um, but then one day I decided it looks better without it. Like, like I was, I would work, I, like the, the grisaille would be my undercolor and then I would slowly do the layers of brown, um, and then I made a painting and I thought this actually looks better this way. And um, I often say like, I'm, I, I didn't know who Carrie James Marshall was at that time. Cause if I had, I probably wouldn't be sitting here because I wouldn't have done it mm -hmm. because I was really working hard at like not being a derivative of anything. I didn't know who Barkley Hendricks was. I came out, you know, I studied with Grace Hardigan. So I was like, just like learning about like all the white male abstract expressionist when I was in graduate school and somehow I missed that but um because yeah I remember when I went to see Carrie James Marshall's exhibition at BMA and I like panicked and I called Arturo and I'm like can I still do this <laughs> like I can't do this anymore like he's doing this and he's like no your work is very different and I've come to see it as very different but for me it was an aesthetic decision that led me um you know evolved into a conversation about interiority and just the opportunity um, to start the conversation differently, if you will, with the viewer, mm -hmm. with the viewer's experience, yeah. Go. Hello, um, I'm very excited about this conversation. So I wanted to, I had a question really about the merging of poetry um, and art. And so forgive me if y'all already answered this question, but I was blazing down 20, 26 to get here um, and 20 to get here. So, but I did want to know in some of your titles, you make, you uh, reference different poets, uh, Black, Black poets in particular. And so could you talk a little bit about um, how you use or how you make the selection um, for some of the titles and wanting to merge poetry in your work? I mean, I read a lot of poetry. I find it to be deeply inspiring and it just always, um, I mean, it opens up the, the words, the way that they're put together, it opens up parts of me that I didn't know existed. Like poetry is, is I think, essential to um, being human almost. Mm -hmm. um, and when I'm coming up with titles, um, if I'm not, you know, asking my sister who's a writer to like brainstorm with me, then I am reading poetry and searching for those words and pulling out things and piecing them together. Um, to bring on either a new meeting or to, to have the same, you know, for it to read the same way that the poet wrote it. But um, in some of my work, like I named a whole, a painting, a whole Lucille Clifton poem. Like sometimes I look back and I'm like, this is really speaking to this moment that this black female poet was having. And I want to honor that by naming it from, you know, from that, from that piece. And it's just a way for me to, um, I guess, you know, connect myself to that to that part of, um, of, of their creativity. Yeah. I, I listened to books or it was one point or like some poetry, like I, I was listening to Claudia Rankin's 
um, citizen yeah. when I was painting. And I remember when, um, at the time when I was doing this one piece, I was thinking of my cousin who was a Howard grad. <laughs> so go <Okay>. Howard. <laughs> I was thinking of my cousin and, um, and she had passed away. And it was this one line yesterday called and said we were together. And I remember that was it, you know, like I paused, I had to stop painting and just like write it down. Yeah. And I remember just that line was exactly at my memory of being with her. Mm -hmm. And that became a title of one of my pieces. But I was also sometimes even with music, like I was listening to Coldplay mm -hmm. and the painting that's in the uh, Black Portrait book, what was it, um, The Space in Which We Travel. It was just a line in there. And sometimes I'll just hear it while I'm listening and painting, I'll hear the words and I just stop. It, 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 it's like, there it is, there's something. Yeah, it triggers something. Yes. And I'll say me too. Yeah, me too. <laughs> me too. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, um, my question is more so around the topic of womanhood, being a black woman. And so throughout, you know, trauma of being a black woman here today uh, in America, how do you express um, your feelings and maybe that sense of like agency? And how does art, you know, help you do that? Well, not only telling women's stories, black women's stories, but even your story. And we've talked about that a lot. So I just want to Ooh, sorry, a little reiteration. That's a that's a tough one. That's a big. <laughs> I think womanhood. Um, we're always trying to define ourselves and exist in a space, especially as Black women, that there is no space for us. So I think just the nature of us being artists, right? You you're demanding like I have a right to do this thing that everybody thinks is nothing. Um. And I think it's also within our individual, my individual spirit, you know, and me seeing other artists who came before me, when you mentioned like Augusta Savage, mm -hmm. or when I see uh, living legends like Deb Willis, you know, uh, as a mother and an artist. And so they're my exemplars, the people who I follow and want to be like, they exist and I'm reading up about them. If I read about Selma Burke, or Lois Jones, or Elizabeth Catlett. And I also look in their biographies and, and I feel like I want to know how they did it. And if they could do it, then there's no way that I can, even considering the suffering or the traumas that they went through, mm -hmm. that they thrived. So I have to do it. Thank you. I was just, you mentioned Gordon Parks and I thought about American Gothic. And yes. Black it's a beautiful women, so. photo. And actually I read recently um, American Gothic, you know, she's holding the broom. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think her name is Ella Mae Watson. It is. But they found a letter from her at the foundation where she was being put out of her apartment because she couldn't afford her rent, which was something like $24. And they had given her like three months that she could pay a little at a time. And so she was writing to Gordon Parks and I guess to Life Magazine, if they could they help her? But I don't know what happened, but she was going to be evicted. And she was a grandmother who was raising her grandchildren and she had adopted other children. And so it made the so much more beautiful that this woman is. And she described herself as the charwoman. Mm -hmm. And it just, it really struck me how this woman we look at so iconic, what she went through in her life. And I hope that she didn't get put out afterwards, but I don't yeah. know. Mm -hmm. Me too. Thank you so much. Um, my question is really technical. I'm a painter as well, and I'm obsessed with all of you, as <laughs> everyone here <laughs> is, I'm sure. I'm, and it may seem like a lowbrow question, but I'm really, really interested in the time and process of the work, mm -hmm. particularly with Ms. Rawls, because the water, I'm obsessed yeah. with water, and the way you're doing water is incredible to me so I'm just really curious about process and the basics how long how much time is invested in a it, piece it depends on the scale really um and then like yeah I'm there sometimes from like 8 39 in the morning until 7 p.m each day and I said I try to take breaks it just I, it's really hard to say you're in it because I'm in it and I get lost in it. Um, but it could be a couple months sometimes. 
per piece. I can see that. You know, yeah. sometimes a month. Yeah, what it is. Yeah, yeah, just depending on the on the size and scale. But yeah, and especially the huge one. Like I'm, and Working it's and that. it's a lot of hours. So I don't know exactly how long, but it's time. And you're right. And then I try to let myself. I, every time I get bigger brushes and put them there, <laughs> I just don't use them. <laughs> Some parts, but mostly I'm like, oh, and I get caught up. I'm like, you know? yeah. So I don't. You know, I'm trying to loosen in certain areas. But yeah. And Kalita's really mastered like acrylic, yes, in a way. Because I paint with yeah. oils, she paints with acrylic. She's really learned how to work with them in a way that um, adds a lot of, to her process. Yes. Um, I feel like we've been working together since college because mm -hmm. we met in drawing class That's and great. we oftentimes paint on FaceTime together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But then like so <laughs> <laughs> but then like sometimes, you know, there's there's moments when you're like really into something and you can't talk. Right. So like we just not saying nothing for like an hour. You know? yeah. mm -hmm. But um like say for example, the motorcycles that I painted for my last exhibition took me a little over a year. To paint both of them, um, it's it's I never want to paint motorcycles again, basically. <laughs> but you know, it's the it's I don't know, it's 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 layers and layers and layers. Same as Cleta in the studio at ten, leaving at ten sometimes. Mm -hmm. Last three months before a deadline, to seven days a week. Um, it's not like the job just has to get done; you just yeah. have to do it. But yeah. it, you know, and you're constantly perfecting your craft. I still feel like I get better and better every painting that I do. Um, and hopefully that will never stop. I think there's some aspects of my earlier work that I really like when um, my skill level wasn't what it is today. Um, but I don't know how to unpaint, you know? So I just kind of like go with it, but I think it's, yeah, it's just hours and learning about the paint, how it works for you, like your drying times, like planning ahead, working on multiple paintings so that you're not mm -hmm. um, wasting time, so that mm -hmm. you're you're constantly cycling in and out of like different pieces, um, and making sure that they're in conversation with each other, mm -hmm. um, not only you know maybe thematically, but also just color wise for me, like I'm planning the um, exhibition and thinking about what background colors, you know, like mm -hmm. I have like a, a mock-up of the gallery space. So then I'm like, well, I can't have two pinks. I need like to think of a background color that's going to like go with the rest of the ones that are going to be in this room. Like, just, you know, a lot of, mm -hmm. a lot of that kind of stuff. I want to interject one question. I'm going to have that. Um, around because you're talking about time and in terms of like the time it takes to create a work, but I'm also thinking about the time or the path that you've, uh, all kind of journeyed on to success. Mm -hmm. And Visa and I were talking right before we got on stage about how, you know, you were an art teacher yeah. for oh, like nearly 15 years. Yeah. And I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I actually first, before even meeting you formally, Kalita, I, I had your book, mm -hmm. uh, your children's book um, as well. And so, and also, Amy, I read how, um, I think it was a quote of yours where it's like, you know, my career didn't start with the Michelle Obama painting. Like that's maybe how I got mm -hmm. like, worldwide you know recognition yeah you know, you've been working for a, a number of years time. before a long time so can you just talk about because i think it's important for the students to hear mm -hmm. about yeah. this like you know kind of sometimes windy pathway uh to mm -hmm. where you are now yeah. mm -hmm. but i always say you have to be comfortable with risk if you want to be an artist it's not an easy path um you have to be creative and in, in how you work you want to like for me teaching didn't work because i'm an introvert and when I did teach, I would come home and just be too exhausted to like do anything for myself. Mm -hmm. So I had to find other ways. And like for me, waiting tables was the way that I could make money without having to expend personal energy. Um, and I could still, you know, make work during the day and then go to work at nighttime. Um, yeah, it's a it's an up and down path. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, Kalita graduated, got married, had children. I still don't have any, I mean, like we've all got here in different, like, different, yeah, right. different ways. Mm -hmm. um, there is no one right way or wrong way. I think the most important thing is just to make sure that you focus your energy on the thing that you want to bring to fruition and not getting caught up in a lot of the other stuff that might come along with um, 
I'd say like being friends with civilians, which are people that are non-artists <laughs> that <laughs> work and get jobs and they're buying houses and they're doing these things. And, you know, for me, when I was like 35 and still waiting tables, the civilians are like in my ear, you know, because my life doesn't make sense to them, but it makes sense to me. And so you have to make sure that you keep a core group of people around you mm -hmm. that um, will will keep you moving forward because you're going to want to give up. Like I used to dream about just quitting my job and being a Walmart greeter. I'm like, I can just go home and watch Dancing with the Stars. I won't be stressed out. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it just, it, it's hard. But I think it's, if you have the determination and the talent and you don't quit, then you'll eventually rise to the top because there's a lot of people out there that don't have the fortitude that it takes to get to this point because they don't have the work ethic or they don't want to, you know, risk working for something that's that's not empirical where they may there may be a reward at the end or there may not um so i just say keep working hard don't give up you're going to make a whole lot of awful paintings before you make some really good ones it's part of the process so don't get down on yourself i think living life and filling yourself up with travel and books and things like that is also really essential to making good work it just doesn't happen in your studio a lot of the work making of the work happens outside of the studio um and then you bring that in to your work so if you if you're saying that you have creative block it's just just go out and live some and like do some stuff and then come back to it and like you'll have some things to you'll have some fodder to to put into the work and excellent oh, answer sorry. no you go ahead because i was like that's great <laughs> I just, all of that i would you say <laughs> teachers dream of being Walmart readers too. Yeah, because <laughs> <laughs> and it is exhausting yeah. giving yourself a bit of yourself. If I have 30 kids in a 40 minute class period, yeah. You have about less than a minute to have individual interactions with mm. each yeah. of those 30 children. Yeah. And so if there's one who needs more attention, but you go home really tired. Yeah. Um I feel like teaching, like when you said your outside fills you up. I feel like teaching helped me become who I am now as an mm -hmm. artist because I had to care about 30 people at a time mm -hmm. for 40 minutes. And each of each child needs to feel that I care about them mm -hmm. or I can't teach them. Mm -hmm. If you think your teacher hates you, are you about to listen to them? No. Or they're disgusted by you or they're scared of you or whatever. They don't approve of you, your gender, your religion, your race your amount of money that you have. So I feel like that helped me be more real and more yeah. emp empathetic, mm -hmm. more loving, more careful. Mm -hmm. And then when I create my artwork, I'm thinking about my subjects the same way. I don't know them. Yeah. Um, and I, I need to treat them with care. Mm -hmm. So I think if, even if your path is long, that is worthwhile because it's yeah. your path. Yeah. You know, some people have a very short life and they live life very, very quickly. And some people have a long life. So if your thing is taking long, you have to recognize that's a blessing it that is. you have that time. To being do. a late bloomer, there's nothing wrong with being a late bloomer. Like I was 40 years old and mm -hmm. still nobody knew who I was. You know what I mean? Yeah. But I was still making work. I knew I had, I knew I had something like I knew I had a pot of gold in my studio. Nobody knew it yet, but yeah. me. <laughs> yeah. And I That's just good. stopped sure. teaching five years ago. Yeah. So it's your path is your path. Yes, and that's, that's true. fine. Mm -hmm. I did graphic don't design. Yourself to anybody yeah. else. Yeah. Don't. Compare, yeah. I did graphic design. I did all different ways to um, pay bills, you know. And uh, but I think I learned through all of those experiences. Mm -hmm. um, it is. Yes, yeah, a blessing to yeah. take from all of that yeah. and put it in the world. So, apology. Thank you for letting mm -hmm. me. Um, hi. Uh, first, I would like to say, as a student of the AUC and a student of the AUC Art Collective, thank you for your words, your wisdom, and your presence today. Um, it really means a lot. And I'm kind of shaking because I'm like, nervous. But <laughs> um, with these artworks, there's an automatic pull and resonance to the visual attraction, the visual aesthetic of it all. But my question is, what is your process with titling them and giving them this linguistic life along with the visuals? Um, for, for me, it was poetry. 
um, and I'm remembering now that you're asking that that it it started with um, like a publication that the Student Museum of Harlem did a long time ago, and they paired an artist with a poet. And um, so her name was uh, Shana. She wrote the poem about one of my paintings. And for me, that's when that connection started because her words brought to life, again, like, you know, what, what I was doing. Um, my first language is visual. So words are like, you know, I'm good with them, but it's not my thing. So um, that, that's my relationship with it. And I think that's something that's, that's like, I mean, if you think back to the 1950s or, you know, when I speak to older artists, like poets and artists were always hanging out and responding to each other's yeah, work. Mm -hmm. Um, I think the two go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Even when um, I did the uh, uh, the Water Dancer cover on Hussey Coates' book, mm -hmm. and when I was um, working on that, he would send me uh, beginning parts of the manuscript and just like reading it, 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 it was like a response, call and response type of thing we were doing with each other. I ended up doing like six mm -hmm. ideas for the covers and it was just really fun reading and imagining what could be, but I often listen to audiobooks while I'm painting and I think of the words and I think of like the power, it's, you know, it comes from the word and I try to put that in. Yeah. And for me, my husband is a DJ. He's there. Hey, Don. <laughs> <laughs> and so I am um, of the hip hop generation and I realized how powerful music is as a communicator. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel like the message is so strong with music. Sometimes it's not as quick and easy as it is with visual art. We have to sit sometimes and study. So I'll just take song titles or book titles. I feel like the wordsmiths have already done it. Mm -hmm. And I don't need to do that as well. Although I'm sure there are some artists who sit and create unique titles. But I think for me, I'd like to find it. I want somebody else to help me with describing <laughs> this thing. So unfortunately, we had time for two more questions. I'm already kind of like pushing it because I already got the, <laughs> the signal. So if you guys want to try and combine, not sure, but. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Ana Villavasa. I'm a freshman presidential scholar here at Spelman College. And I'm pursuing a BA in art with a minor in marketing. And, you know, coming in as a freshman and, you know, I just got here and there's a lot of anxiety about, you know, what does an artist do? What can she do with her future? And so I was kind of wondering, you know, what kind of impact your undergraduate experiences, especially at an HBCU, had on, you know, where you are now. So basically, for lack of a better word, how did you get here and why? Well, it gave me sisterhood. Yeah. You know, and using and relying on your friends in a way. Um, like Amy had shared that we studied together here and um, I still rely on, you know, talking to Amy and like she said, we FaceTime and we're, um, mm -hmm. even with that the show, um, I did a dream for my Lilith. I remember I bought my, I, I got these canvases and I drew all on them and she was like, make them bigger. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I already got them <laughs> bigger. Um, but just being a student when I was here, um, using each other, almost like a gym partner, mm -hmm. push yourself, mm -hmm. find your friends, find your community and, and come together and, you know, go see shows, learn more. I don't know if this, I'm answering your question. I'm just is, oh, okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> go see what shows are coming, like use each other to keep pushing yourself to learn more about contemporary artists. Um, and see what other artists are doing. Study as much as you can um, the different forms of art, you know, yeah. of abstraction and, or even, you know, figurative work and see who's out there, what they've done from the past and the present. And um, your other classmates, I think talking with them, those that have you know, the commonality and that interest in art, you're going to need each other. Yeah, the need, friendships I, you build now will, are going to carry you through out the rest of your life. I feel like the, the, the friendships that um, keep me lifted are the ones that I I made here. And then like the, the couple of friends that I made in graduate school, because you have that shared experience and those are the people that know who you really are. So 15 years from now, when you're 
trying to make it happen. Like they're going to be the ones that are going to be rooting you on and giving you the support that you need. M maybe even loans, you know. But um, <laughs> but yeah, I think it's that's it's the sisterhood. Yeah. Yeah. But taking as many, um, I hope that the art program here, the drawing classes, the painting classes, all those giving you that foundation is really important. You know, and learning as much as you can, studying as much as you can about what, you know, what's happening is, is pivotal. I didn't think I appreciated it when I was here as much as I No, I didn't. Now. Yeah. I was like, I don't want to learn. I got to memorize these slides. Yeah. Yeah. We had to memorize then, slides in art history class and like make little drawings so we know that it was a Manet painting, you know? Yeah. yeah. It's like so different now because it's digital. And I was going to say, congratulations to you. Yeah. Yeah. For, your degree and your scholarship. That's really um, incredible. And you're in this amazing environment. Your professors have a lot of information that they can share with you. And the legacy of Spelman itself, that it's the reading up, like what did other people do and talking to them, that you'll be able to figure out your way and have people who will help you, like you said, for the rest of your life. Yeah. And we're here. I always say I'm here. You guys can reach out to me anytime you want to. Thank you. Your phone gonna blow up. It's like, <laughs> about to say, I was like, are you, are you sure? No, <laughs> and it like literally never does. I'm like, no, but, yeah. but I'm like, if you have, you know, it's it's when it's like no. five years from now when you're mm -hmm. out, like that's when you're gonna need to to like that's when you're like, how do I respond to this email? Like, what do I do this? Like, that's yeah. when you need. Mm -hmm. That's when you need us. So call on us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you do yeah. need to write, and we are there. I'm being funny, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> Kalina's like no, oh, no, 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 no. You just, yeah, we are here. We we are here to show you. I mean, we broke different glass ceilings, Amy of the Shore, and we're all coming through, and we're here to help you so we make it easier. I think that's just you know. Mm -hmm. But also, you'll be on campus more. I will be. Fall. Her daughter's coming to Spelman. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna be around a lot. I'm excited. <laughs> So we, uh, we're we going to make time for two more questions, yeah. but also one online question. So, um, so yeah, so we're going to make. Hi, my name is Savannah Woodson. I'm a first year art history major and artist myself here at Spelman College. So my question is for Ms. Rawls today. Um, as it pertains to Blackness, how is the idea of freedom in water connected to the idea of freedom in our collective Black community? Oh, okay. This, this is a good question. one. Let me think. Uh, <laughs> very it's a very good question. Thank you for asking. Um, freedom. I mean, I think that um, having agency and um, knowing who you are and being confident leads you into freedom because you push yourself because you know what you deserve. And I think there's very important in my work to show that this power over an element that is bigger than yourself, which makes me think of life. You know, water itself, you have to um, let go and submit when you're in water mm -hmm. to float and to rise. And if, if you're all tense, you're going down. And I think that in itself is a way to walk through life is recognize this, large, this, this plan is bigger than us mm -hmm. and you have to submit and let go of where it takes you, but yet be confident and move through it. And I think I try to think about that often in my work. And that is a form of freedom. Thank you. Thank you. I know. All right. Bring us home, girl. <laughs> Last question. Thank you so much for being here. And thank you to our organizers for tonight. Um, our online question is for Lisa. Lisa. I understand that you were a painting major in college. What made you switch from using paint to cloth as your primary medium? I just love your work. Um, Tammy, raise your hand. Her. That's why. <laughs> that was the baby who I was pregnant with my last year at Howard. So it was, she demanded that the painting come to an end. <laughs> and I started adding on fabric bit by bit. Um, gluing it on because I still needed to graduate with a painting degree. Um, in my last critique, half of my professors didn't feel I should graduate at all mm. because I there was so much fabric on the piece and just a little <laughs> bit of paint. <laughs> so I had half the 
professors were arguing that I was painting with, with fabric. Mm -hmm. And the other half were saying, well, she didn't fulfill the requirements of her degree. And I went home and I lived on a few blocks from campus and I was five months pregnant. And as you know, sometimes when you're pregnant, you're thinking about other things. You would think I'd be crying and super upset. I was really just thinking about what happens next for me. And I don't remember the phone call telling me that you graduated, but I did. So I guess that was the impact. It had little impact. I already knew what I needed to do regardless of what they said. And when I started, when I graduated, then I started quilting all the way and stopped painting. Because then I had a little baby who was around putting everything in her mouth. So. I have to say something. I remember yes. meeting you. Yes. It was about 20 something years ago. Over 20 years. Over something years yeah. ago. We were in an art fair together yeah. in Philadelphia. Yeah. And um, my husband surprised me and got a piece because I was in that fair and I was like, that, I want that. I want, <laughs> I want, and that she was one of my yeah. first pieces of art that yeah. I bought yeah. was Beesus. Yeah. And that's, that's the piece that's next to my front door. It's next to the front door of my house. Yes, wow. And I remember that. And I was like, yeah. I got to be some public yeah. early. Because <laughs> we were in that fair. I was like that yeah. right there. That's that's yeah. the truth. And that was my first art fair. Yeah. Oh. It was 20 something Tom's years ago. And I remember meeting. Yeah. 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 That was awesome. yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, unfortunately, we have to end this conversation, but there is going to be a reception afterwards mm -hmm. where students can ask you questions directly. But thank you so much, thank Amy, you. Clita, thank Lisa, for being so generous. Oh boy, Howard, H U. What I represent? Well, I represent Howard. <laughs> Thank you so much. We have, we have this mic. Do you want to say something? Yeah. Oh, I just okay. I. I uh, before we leave. <laughs> Go ahead, please. Well, I just want a point of pri uh, personal privilege. Um, this is a educational institution and there are people who have contributed a lot to the success of these women. I particularly wanted to mention Arturo, who has been, Arturo Lindsay, who has been referred to, Arturo stand up. He has been referred to many times and I know he has made a big difference in the lives of these women, so. And I don't know if there are any other uh, Spelman art professors who are here who have contributed, but uh, if anybody else is here, please. Clark Atlanta. Clark Atlanta, okay, yeah, sorry. Okay, Clark Atlanta. So just wanna recognize all the people who um, contributed. And as we know, this inst these institutions have really made such a contribution to so many lives here, so thank you. I will let Cheryl close it out. Thank you so much, President President Gale. Um, and, and I just wanna say thank you again to our moderator and our panelists. I mean, this was a fantastic conversation. It's just, just the beginning of our symposium. Uh, as President Gale said, and also as Naima Keith shared, we have a reception outside waiting for you. We also have books. That is the catalog for the show is for sale and other books are for sale by many of the esteemed scholars and artists here. So please come out and enjoy a book. Um, I also just wanted to point out that for tomorrow, um, tomorrow we will be beginning, we'll be, we will be beginning um, at nine o'clock uh, in the morning at the um, at the Woodruff Library. That's at 111 James P. Brawley Drive, Southwest. So um, that's the library that we all use at the Atlanta University Center. Um, we'll begin with Dr. Bridget R. Cooks, um, who's here with us. There's a lot of California in the house today, which I'm really, really happy for. Um, and she's going to be introducing our keynote speaker, Dr. Deborah Willis. There's also a lot of New York in the house tonight. We'll be follow, following the keynote address with a performance by our own Department of Dance um, that's going to be headed by uh, Julie, um, Julie B. Johnson, who's uh, the curator um, with the cast of students and professors from the Department of Dance. We're really excited 
um, by this particular contribution to the way that we think about portraiture and movement. We'll be uh, following that with uh, another panel that's going to be uh, moderated by Karen Comer Lowe. Uh, with Nydia Blas, who's one of our professors here in the house uh, in the Department of Art and Visual Culture and Photography, Sheila Pre Bright, Genevieve Gagnard as well will be on that panel. So we're really, really excited for that. Um, we'll have a lunch break. And I just want to remind you uh, for lunch, please come back over to see our own next generation of artists. We have studio visits with our graduating seniors. Um, so please come here for that. We'll also have during the day opportunities for you to have your Black American portrait made. And then when we come back from lunch at two o'clock, we have a panel that's moderated by our own Dr. Shady Radical, a professor here in the Department of Art and Visual Culture uh, with Melissa Alexander and Gabrielle Morse, who's a graduate of Spelman College, class of 2022. And then the last uh, panel of the day, uh, excuse me, before the last panel of the day, we have Ming Joy Washington, uh, who will be reading a Black American portrait in poetry, also a Spelman alumna. And then the last panel of the day at 345 is monumental portraiture with Renee Cox and Ada Pinkston in conversation with our own Myra Green, the chair of the Department of Art and Visual Culture here at Spelman College. Um, we'll be ending the day with a reception at the Clark Atlanta University Art Museum. So we want you to all join us for that reception from 5.30 to 7 tomorrow evening. And again, it's a movable feast and we really invite you to join us and let's go outside and have something to eat for the reception. Thank you all so much. Oh, okay. Thank <laughs> you. 